You suck with the Empire. Admit it. Go on, I've heard it all before. You do. Now please, admit it. And today I'm going to tell you why. Has Ulrich thrown you to the wolves? Or has Sigmar forsaken you? Well, don't worry. Elector Count Boris Blakebringer is here to look after you. And today, you'll understand why you suck with the Empire, Karl Franz, and Reichland as a faction. As a disclaimer, this is not a guide for multiplayer. It would take more sorcery than the Altdorf College of Mages could maintain to explain why you're so terrible at that. My name is Blake and I bid you my fondest welcome to Blake's Takes, where today I'll be giving you my take on why you're just awful with the Empire. Is my take hot or not? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoy today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Now we unite. In our darkest hour, a spiteful world awakens forgotten evils to break us. We must purge those that dare confront us. Follow me and we will rage against the dying of the light together. Reason you suck with the Empire. Number one. You don't surprise the secessionists. You start at war with the Empire secessionists. As a starting enemy, they're not too difficult to get rid of. However, they can sometimes prove tenacious if they station their second army inside of Helmgard Fortress. Start your campaign by attacking and dispatching their small starting force here. Once beaten, take the city of Grunberg and immediately hire another lord there. This lord will follow Karl Franz around to lap up experience. Now proceed down to Ubersreich and liberate that city. Once you've taken Ubersreich, the secessionists will often send their remaining forces to hole up in Helmgard. Now, assaulting Helmgard head-on is a terrible idea with your starting forces. You will take tremendous casualties from the fighting. That's if you can even win the battle at all. This is why we hired the extra lord earlier. This lord will goad the secessionists out of their fortress into your clutches. Set Karl Franz to an ambush in this wooded position here. He'll have a 70% chance of ambushing from the fort. Set your goading lord to the raid stance just next to him. The secessionists will then launch the attack on your lord, allowing Karl to reinforce and wipe them from the map. I recommend also resolving the fight so no survivors are left behind to retreat back to Helmgard. Now, with that army dispatched, you're free to either finish the Altdorf starting province or go after Helmgard itself. Remember that the enemy can still recruit spearmen and archers from Fort Helmgard, so you'll need to siege Helmgard at some point. Or the secessionists will cause you a bit of mischief, sending hordes of their low-tier troops to invade your starting province. I recommend taking Helmgart first to prevent another army from taking root in there, then moving up to Eilhart to finish your starting province. So remember, pick up a starting lord early and use them to goad the secessionists out of Helmgart should they choose to hole up in there. Attacking Helmgart head on whilst that army is garrisoned in there is a mistake. Set up the ambush and have them come to you. Reason you suck with the Empire, number two you fall into the Marienburg trap. You've just finished your starting province and the secessionists have been thoroughly crushed. You're feeling like quite the dude. I'm the dude, so that's what you call me, you know? Marienburg stands next to you, a tasty morsel of a city with a delicious high value port which will increase trade amongst your burgeoning nation whilst filling your coffers nicely. The faction governing it is an empire race but not tied to your imperial authority system, so you will not lose authority should they be wiped out. You feel the pull of its siren call willing you to invade it, your hand hovering over the declare war button. You lust after the corpulent riches that lie within the fabled trading hub. It is precious to me. What's that? You want me to drink you? But I'm in the middle of a trial. Excuse me. Snap out of it, Blake. You've got this. Remember the steps. Taking Marienburg in the early game is a mistake, for multiple reasons. Firstly, the city's port was nerfed and is now nowhere near as wealthy as it was back in Warhammer 2. If you take the settlement early, the port will only generate you 200 gold a turn 
and give some pretty meagre bonuses to trade relationships at Tier 1, and will take a long time for you to grow this territory up to Tiers 3 and 5 where the port starts getting really good. It's not really worth making an enemy of Marienburg this early into the campaign. This is because you have far more pressing concerns to the north and the east. Festus the Leech Lord will be raising settlements with reckless abaddon. Kazrak the One-Eye starts at war with you and his Beastman hordes will be descending on you very shortly. Dryker will also be consolidating her power, wiping Elector Counts from the face of the earth, all the while the rotten canker of Vlad's vicious and virulent vampiric corruption will be vitiating the Vicinal Viscounts around you. These violent vermin must be vanquished so we might vindicate the vigilant and the virtuous. Verily this fishy soir of verbiage veers most verbose, so let me simply add that you will get your cheeks clapped vigorously if you don't deal with these threats first. Are you like a crazy person? Lasagna, 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 lasagna. Also, Marienburg has two other settlements which make up the wasteland, Gorsel and Arnau. So the Marienburg faction will not be wiped out if you just take the main city. This means you will now be involved in a war on multiple fronts, when you only have one army to defend. It's not a clever move, especially when you have the Beastmen hordes breathing down your neck. Thirdly, if you ignore my advice and conquer Marienburg early, it will make you diplomatically visible to both Belakor and Wolfric the Wanderer, two very aggressive factions that will likely declare war on you very shortly after meeting you meaning yet more enemies to fight on this newly opened front. It is for these three reasons that I implore you to avoid taking Marienburg early and focus on dealing with your pressing, more immediate concerns, your first priorities being Kazrak the One-Eye and then Festus. Now, eventually you do want to take Marienburg. It's an extremely lucrative city which gives good bonuses and also the Bordermen unique outriders with grenade launchers. More on them shortly. The region will make quite the feather in your cap. You must, however, exercise patience and strike when the time is right. I noticed that the Barrow Legion took the city on turn 12, and Kemmler was stuck in Force March just outside the city. I asked Marienburg themselves to pay me for my vampire extermination services, and I carried out that work with gusto. I rewarded myself with their city afterwards. At this point, I had wiped out Kazrak and I had consolidated the lands north of me into a stronger state, so I wouldn't have the instant reprisal of the ruinous powers. It also got me into the good books of the Bretonians to the west. I had noticed that the Barrow Legion had taken it and had been embroiled in multiple battles with the Marienburg faction, so they had likely taken casualties. That's why my armies were there to pounce on an opportunity just like this. So remember, after taking your starting province, avoid declaring war on Marienburg and falling into the Marienburg trap. You have much more pressing concerns in Kazrak One-Eye and Festus the Leech Lord to the north of you. Taking Marienburg makes you diplomatically visible to both Belakor and Norsken factions, so you really need to make sure you're confident in your army's abilities to defend the newly acquired turf when you take it. Assess the situation carefully and only strike when you are certain you can deal with the consequences. For consequences, there shall certainly be. Reason you suck with the Empire Number 3. You don't know how Empire armies work. The Empire is advertised as an all-rounder faction, with solid choices in all spheres of combat. This is a lie. Your melee infantry is a critical weakness of yours. Your best melee infantry, I find, are your spearmen with shields. They have the highest melee defence of your melee infantry selections and thus will hold the line longer. This is all your melee troops do. Do not make the mistake of thinking that your melee infantry troops will accomplish anything other than getting in the way of the enemy. They will do next to no damage. Even your so-called elite greatswords, who are advertised as anti-infantry armour-piercing units, I find, perform very poorly and will often lose without range support. Your melee troops are nothing more than a roadblock, a wall of steel to protect your ranged units whilst they dish out the damage. That's why you should only recruit spearmen with shields and only in small numbers. 
They have the highest melee defence of your melee infantry and thus hold the line for the longest. They're also considerably cheaper than greatswords, which is a nice bonus. Once you understand this concept, your Empire games will go a lot smoother. Now, in the very early game, archers are a great unit to pad your numbers, and en masse they can deal a reasonable amount of damage. They're also very cheap to recruit and maintain, so utilising them is very efficient. You can also hire these guys everywhere, you don't even need a barracks, so they're very versatile. At the very early stages of your campaign, these happy chappies should be making up the majority of your armies. Later on down the tech tree, you have a fantastic mix of ranged infantry to select from. Huntsmen are fantastic against large enemies, crossbowmen are good for taking down unarmoured enemies, and handgunners are good at whittling down armour. I personally prefer a handgunner and huntsman combination in my middle and late game armies. Unfortunately, Huntsmen require the Hunter and the Beast DLC to unlock, which is a shame because they're basically your only form of anti-large damage in the early game. As discussed earlier, your melee infantry may have anti-large damage in Spearmen and Halberders, but they simply don't do enough of it to kill things effectively. Let me say this again, your melee troops don't do damage. Your damage comes from range. Huntsmen are solid because they stalk and can fire whilst moving. They will, however, get their cheeks clapped in melee, so it's a good idea to have some cavalry nearby to intercept any would-be chasers. Huntsmen don't have 360 degree firing like many other stalking skirmish units, so when they're running backwards they'll be unable to fire on their pursuers, leaving them very vulnerable to enemy fast movers they're still a very valuable unit that fills a serious gap in the Empire's early game roster though, so I normally bring at least two of them in every army. Because all of your early game damage will come from ranged units, it's a very good idea to check the terrain of a battle whenever you're going into a fight. Sometimes you might just roll a map which you will have almost no chance of winning without taking very heavy casualties, if at all. Look out for maps with a lot of woods and a lot of mountains using this button here. Your ranged units operate the best with even and unforested terrain. Auto resolve might be giving you a decisive victory here, but the map could basically stop you from possibly getting such a good result. So bear this in mind and always check the terrain of the map you're fighting on before engaging. Sometimes it is better to just retreat and hope for a better map. This is also true when you're relying on reinforcements to win a battle for you. Your armies are heavily dependent on formations and positioning due to your ranged firepower. Your reinforcements may come in from a horrible angle and be useless to you because of this. This is often why auto-resolve is your best friend in these sorts of situations. So what if I can't auto-resolve the fight? I hear you cry. Well, let me run you through the tactics I employ to maximise my chances of success. Utilise small single entity lords and heroes up front to tank the advance of the enemy whilst your missile units unleash devastation on them. A common mistake is to put your single entity tank units too close to your ranged units. If you have them too close they will likely just walk around your single entity, invalidating their role on the battlefield. Keep them just within range of your missile troops to give them the best chance of tying up the enemy. I like using warrior priests on foot for this job. They're a small entity with a very high melee defence, so they're perfect for this role. Empire captains can also carry out this role, and I'd suggest removing them from their mounts to boost their melee defence. Then I like to put my spearmen on the flanks to intercept any flanking units and to goad units into my ranged units firing lines. Unlike your Kislevian counterparts, your ranged units will be torn to shreds in melee. They're not hybrids at all. They will sometimes get caught, and there's no stopping that. But to counter this, spread your ranged units out so they can fire on enemies that have reached your other ranged units in melee. If they're spread out, then they will be unlikely for one enemy melee unit to tie up multiple ranged units of yours. Now, a ranged unit which will make your life considerably easier in the early game is Outriders with Grenade Launchers. These guys absolutely slaughter enemy infantry and you can get them from a tier 3 stable, but only if you have a gunsmith built too. I take these guys well into the late game.
they're fast and do catastrophic damage to infantry and even light cavalry. Vanguard deploy them right next to the enemy so they can start unleashing volleys of grenades from the get-go, then move them back to reload and launch another devastating volley. Similarly to Kislev war sleds, these skirmish cavalry units are such a threat that often the enemy will send fast movers to chase after them to deal with them. Move your outriders back to your gun lines to isolate and destroy enemy fast movers quickly. When in range of your handgunners and crossbowmen, try to get your outriders to run back from side to side so your ranged units can easily fire on their pursuers. If you run directly backwards into your firing lines, then your ranged units will be obstructed. Try to go diagonally so this doesn't happen. They're also great in sieges. They can arc their grenades over obstacles to clear out pockets of hard-to-reach archers. Get a couple of these guys in every army. You won't regret it. Your artillery in the early game really isn't much to write home about. Cannons and mortars both leave a lot to be desired. They're so average, in fact, that I basically skip them and just get out riders with grenade launchers instead. They're not bad artillery units, but I just think the outriders with grenade launchers give you far more tactical flexibility with their speed, and they do considerably more accurate damage. Your artillery gets good when you hit tier 4 in your settlements, and you access the beautiful Hellstorm rocket battery. This excellent artillery piece is what defines the Empire's artillery. It's wildly inaccurate, but you can use it to carpet bomb areas and rack up absurd quantities of kills. They're also excellent for offensive sieges, smashing infantry in garrisons and destroying buildings. Be careful where you place them though, they can very easily start firing into your own units due to their inaccuracy. I make sure to have nothing in front of them for precisely this reason. I pick up two of these in every army moving forward. A quick way to boost your artillery is to get the Nuln Gunnery School. This building lets you unlock Hellstorm rocket batteries at Tier 3, and provides an experience bonus to new recruits whilst also reducing upkeep for all artillery units faction-wide. Steam tanks are actually excellent. I love a steam tank. When they become available to recruit, I put two in every army and start calling my armies Franza Divisions. <laughs> Steam tanks are an unbreakable single entity unit which fire on the enemy and cause terror to surrounding combatants. Put these up front in a similar role to your warrior priests. Now, they won't deal a lot of damage, but the clue is in the name. They tank damage for you. Pair these with a life wizard and they can hold out basically indefinitely from the healing they'll receive. Remember, they won't do a lot of damage, but they will hold out until they die and with a reasonable health pool and a lot of armour, that will be a long time. I also find them fantastic in sieges. Once you've softened up the enemy with your artillery and magic, send these in at the front with handgunner support behind. Remember that these are not a traditional artillery piece. They need to be up at the front with your warrior priests holding the line. Now, your early game cavalry is pretty average. It has its uses, but to be honest, it leaves a lot to be desired. Even Reichsguard, I find, will often get beaten in fights which I really thought they'd win. They're also extremely awkward to build, requiring their own Tier 3 building. Your cavalry gets good when you hit Tier 4 in a settlement, and you gain access to Demigriff Knights. When you can recruit Demigriffs, always get the Halberd variant. You already have plenty of tools for killing infantry. You lack tools that take out large units and monsters. Get the Halberd variant and have them protect your flanks. Empire Knights and Reichsguard, I don't bother with. I'd rather have more ranged infantry to dish out more damage. They have their uses, but I find they trade too poorly into most of the units to bother bringing them. So remember, faith, steel and gunpowder. Faith that your warrior priests, captains and lords will hold back the advancing hordes. Steel, 
the armour in which you clad your infantry and steam tank roadblocks with, and gunpowder, the unrelenting power of your munitions which will do the vast majority of your damage. All of your army's damage comes from your ranged firepower, and some magic, but more on that later. Only get a small amount of melee infantry, preferably spearmen with shields as they're cheap, shielded and have a very high melee defence. Great swords are far more expensive and don't really do a good job at fighting things. Get handgunners, huntsmen and outriders with grenade launchers as your core early game ranged contingent. This will give you a good spread of range damage against all unit types. Use single entity heroes like the warrior priest and later on the steam tank to stand far away from but within range of your missile units to prevent enemy units from closing in on you. Space your ranged units apart so they can fire into enemies that reach your missile lines and remember to always check the terrain of maps that you're fighting on. It might be worth withdrawing or auto-resolving if the map is very mountainous or forested. Your artillery only gets strong when you get the Hellstorm rocket batteries. Your low-tier artillery is not going to win games for you. Outriders with grenade launchers and a staunch line of handgunners and huntsmen will though. This, I'm aware, has been quite a long section, so I've made a little handout which can help you bring the Emperor's Wrath down in Sigmar's name. It's available to download in the description below. Remember, your formations really matter. Here's an example of a formation which I would use. Spearmen and cavalry on the flanks, single entity units very far up front, and your gun lines at max range behind them. The idea of loading your flanks with cavalry and spearmen is to goad the enemy into wanting to charge directly at your gun line to get caught on your single entity roadblocks, which is exactly where you want them so your missile units can delete them. You want to move your missile infantry as little as possible so they maximise their firing rate. You don't want to be giving them orders to fire as it'll be messing up their formation. You need to give your missile units sufficient space to be able to fire at each other should an enemy make it past your roadblocks. So, bear this in mind when you're setting up your formation. Reason you suck with the Empire Number 4. You don't understand Imperial Authority and Prestige Now, these are actually quite simple mechanics, but there are a lot of factors that are outside of your control which will impact you. Don't panic. Follow this guide and you'll get there. Imperial authority needs to be at one or greater or you will incur malices to growth, control and income. If your imperial authority falls to minus 10, all remaining elector count factions will declare war on you. You lose imperial authority when an elector count faction gets destroyed or you confederate a faction or through some random events. Imperial authority takes precedence above everything apart from when you're confederating. If you do get a random event and there's an option that loses you Imperial Authority, take the other options. A lot of Elector Count factions will die, causing your Imperial Authority to tank. This is where you are forced to campaign around the Empire territories, killing bad guys and reawakening dead Elector Count factions. Always reawaken dead factions. I'll get onto why shortly. All of your Elector Counts have fealty a measure of how much they think you're the one true God Emperor. If this fealty gets to 10, they will offer to confederate with you. It's normally a good idea to take this confederation no matter how small, because it effectively removes an elect account which you have to babysit, but you do incur a penalty to your imperial authority for doing so. Now, how do I increase fealty? I hear you cry. Well, you have staying in positive imperial authority, this gives you a small chance of fealty increasing across all living Elector Count factions. You have random events which can occur at any time and increase the fealty of any faction. And by far the most dependable method, returning land to an Elector Count. When you conquer a territory in the Empire, you'll get the option to return the land to an Elector Count. This will give you plus one fealty for that faction. The idea is to quickly bulldoze an area, returning all the land you conquered to that elect account, and you'll rack up fealty faster than your uncle racks up credit card debt and cocaine. Prestige is a currency. You earn it from fighting and winning battles. You spend it in random events and making other elect accounts like you. 
always, always, always try to make sure you end your turn with at least 1000 prestige. The reason for this is it will allow you to prevent wars from happening between other elect accounts and in the process gain you imperial authority, but only if you have 1000 prestige to spend on influencing it. These events will only ever trigger at the start of your next turn, so make sure you have the necessary prestige banked to be able to influence the outcome. That magic number is 1000 prestige. Remember that number before you hit the end turn button. If you don't have 1000 prestige, you can go and fight a battle to quickly get some. If you get one of the events which asks you to send troops to aid an elect account, always do this. Spend prestige on this only if you have at least 1000 prestige to deal with issues next turn. If you don't have enough prestige, then spend gold to send out mercenaries. Now, if an elect account faction is wiped out, you always want to reawaken them. The reason for this is to boost your imperial authority. If the faction remains dead, you will have a permanent imperial authority negative modifier on you. Reawaken the faction, boost up your friendship with them by spending a bit of prestige on them, then sell them trade rights, military access and non-aggression pacts. These reawakened factions can be quite lucrative. So remember, you can't always control your imperial authority. Sometimes your elect accounts will just get wiped out. But there are steps you can take to positively influence it. Return all elect account land back to elect account factions to get fealty. Then confederate them. This removes a potential negative modifier from you permanently. Always remember to keep at least 1000 prestige in your bank so you can successfully prevent Empire factions from warring with each other over the end turn. Remember that returning land is almost always the best policy. You can recoup the costs of giving away the territories by selling military access, non-aggression pacts and trade rights to the reawakened factions. You need to aggressively defend the territorial integrity of the Empire. If you let it fall into disrepair and ruination, then you are hardly fitting of the title. Now, you may eventually find yourself dragged into war with another elect account. If that happens, oblige them with the war. Take chunks of their land to keep, but do not wipe them out. Even elect accounts slain by your own hand will decrease your imperial authority. Sue for peace instead once they're down to a single settlement. They will normally bargain for their lives. You can boost their fealty up again by spending prestige and getting your imperial authority up. It's Really very important to eventually own all of the imperial provinces of the empire because you get a lot of bonuses for doing so. You get access to elect account troops which are effectively recruited in a similar fashion to regiments of renown. They hire instantly and you can have multiple units of them. They often come with some slight stat boosts over their normal counterparts and they're very useful for emergency armies as well as getting stronger counterparts. Take for example the Bordermen, which you get from holding the Marienburg province. They have armor-piercing explosive damage, which makes a huge difference to their damage output. There are other really strong units as well, such as the Emperor's Wrath Steam Tank and the Unbreakable Karaburg Greatswords. To unlock these units, you need to assign a Lord as the Count of the Province. This isn't done automatically, so remember to do this, so you can unlock the bonuses and the extra troops. So remember, keep 1000 prestige saved over the end turn. Return factions lands to their counts to gain fealty. Keep doing this until you get their fealty up to 10, then confederate them. Once confederated, assign one of your lords as the elect account of the region to unlock a host of bonuses. Use prestige to make other empire factions like you more but always make sure you have 1000 prestige saved up so you can influence random events over the end turn. Reason you suck with the Empire? Number 5. You don't know how to deal with Vlad. As I alluded to earlier in Reason 2, Vlad is the big bad of your campaign. He is an extremely potent lord who is very, very difficult to kill. He will likely expand and consume a large quantity of your elect account brethren, he can be a very intimidating threat to take on if you don't know what you're doing. Now, his rapid expansion is actually a double-edged sword. As his empire grows larger and stronger, his armies will become more diluted. His forces will be stretched thin. As he grows, so will his list of enemies. And this is my key takeaway for fighting Vlad, and that's to exercise patience. 
During my campaigns, Vlad never actually declared war on me. He would often find himself embroiled in other wars, and I would be the aggressor, declaring war on him when I was ready to. Vlad will almost certainly end up at war with both Tsarina Katerin and Droika, as well as potentially other big players in the East as well. So this will buy you a bit of time to get rid of both Festus and Kazrak to consolidate the North. Don't rush into a war with Vlad. Make sure you've cleared out Festus and Kazrak first to give yourself some breathing room. Now, the key issues you have in facing Vlad on the field are 1. his huge numbers, and 2. Vlad himself. Fighting him fairly is not advised. I like to take multiple armies over and also resolve the fight with him because he's such a nuisance to deal with in battle. Vlad may be strong, but often his units aren't, and you'd be surprised how often you can get the win on him simply by auto-resolving. But if that's too cheesy for you, don't worry, I've got you covered. Now, the footage you're seeing is that of an unbreakable late-game Grimgor Ironhide, mainly because I auto-resolved all of my Vlad battles, but also the concept is very similar. He's a slow, extremely deadly melee combatant, but at least Vlad crumbles. Unbreakable Grimgore stays thick till the end. Firstly, you have to basically ignore Vlad, or in this case Grimgore. Don't let your ranged units get distracted fighting him. You need to fight and destroy the rest of his army. Vlad is a great duelist, meaning he's good against other single entity units, but he's not very good at killing chaff quickly. I mean, he'll definitely kill them, but he'll take a while to do it. Keep him occupied with your melee infantry, and then have your army wipe out the rest of his forces. Vlad will be the last man standing. He always is. Don't waste your ranged unit's time trying to kill him until they have focused down the rest of his army. Then, once he's the last alive, flank around him with your ranged units while he fights a sacrificial unit in melee. It's a slog, but it's doable. It's also worth bringing a death wizard along to cast spirit leech on him if you have access to one of them or a fire wizard to imbue your units with flaming damage to cripple his regeneration and do bonus damage to him whilst popping fireballs off at him. Vlad's key weakness is his speed. He's a very slow character with no access to mounts, so you can outrun him with pretty much anything. Much like this Grimgore, you want to just kite him back and distract him with melee infantry. But because of the pain in having to deal with him man to man, I am very partial to just also resolving fights with him, even if I take substantial losses. Vlad is strong, but his troops aren't. They do not carry much weight in auto resolve. I abuse this advantage to make it easier on myself. I can understand people's disappointment that your esteemed host Blake is not giving some campaign battle footage on how to deal with Vlad, so I span up a quick custom battle, using units which Karl Franz had at the time of invading the vampire counts, and units which were in the armies of Vlad. The results of the battle are indeed painful, but we still get the victory. We distract Vlad with some units. Um, at one point, I even pull my mortar team off their guns to just tie them up in melee. Why won't you die? <laughs> distract him with units whilst you focus on clearing up the rest of his army. When the rest of his army has been killed, then focus your ranged unit's attention onto Vlad himself. It will always be a painful fight against Vlad if you're going to fight him manually. There is no getting away from that. That's why I heartily endorse using auto-resolve to spare yourself the torment. As the Empire, your reinforcements are often going to have a hard time because you need time to set up formations and gun lines as alluded to in Reason 3. When your reinforcements arrive, there will be no doubt that the enemy will have already landed on you making their utility on the battlefield much weaker, which further emphasises the case for auto-resolve in these scenarios. Now, the land itself is hostile to you, as it'll be rife with vampiric corruption. Utilise the encampment stance to negate this, and proceed methodically to deal with the vampire threat. Keep your armies together to reinforce one another. Try to make sure you're encamped after every turn. Be patient, slow, and methodical. So remember, you don't need to rush into a war with Vlad, he will often be busy fighting his neighbours. Take the war to him when you're ready. 
make sure you have multiple armies, as you can be damn sure he'll be running around with multiple full stacks. Far more than you will be able to afford. Don't despair, most of his armies will be made up of garbage. It'll be Vlad himself who will be the main threat. Be patient, wait for the correct opportunity to strike. As his empire will be vast because he swallowed up your elector count friends, there's a very good chance his early victories will have left his armies out of position to defend, and use the encamp stance to prevent attrition from vampiric corruption. If you can, I highly advise auto-resolving any interaction with Vlad. He's a raid boss legendary lord which will take you for a spin. His units don't tend to fare well in auto-resolve, whilst yours do. If you're forced to fight him, ignore him and deal with the rest of his army, as painful as that may be. Sacrifice some melee infantry or a hero to hold him in place whilst you deal with the rest of his forces, then turn your attention onto him. Spirit Leech is good if you have a death caster. Fire magic, which imbues your units with fire damage, can also be very helpful to stop his regeneration. If you run out of ammo and he's still alive, you're in for a rough time. Nothing of yours will be able to beat him in a melee fight, so be sure to conserve enough ammunition to kill him when the time comes. Reason you suck with the Empire? Number 6. You neglect diplomacy. You have a lot of enemies surrounding you, but also a lot of potential allies. Whenever you look to make a war with an enemy, you should always look at who might already be fighting them and get yourself paid to jump into the war. This is a great way to increase diplomatic relations with a faction and fill up your coffers. Have you taken some land that is unsuitable for your faction to settle, such as Norsk and Frozen territories? Well, you can sell it to the Kislevite factions in the area for a tidy profit, as long as they've made some gains nearby. You can do this trick for alliances too. I took Jizero from an offensive war with the Barrow Legion and noticed that Lewin had taken back Castle Artois. This singular piece of territory was never going to be worth all that much so I sold it to Lewin for a military alliance, trade rights and some money. I can't recommend this kind of playstyle enough. Sell territory you capture to speedrun alliance building. I did the same with Carcassonne. I sold them Blackstone Post for money and an alliance. This allows you to shore up your western borders early and prevent any multi-front wars with Bretonia from occurring. Always check your Quick Deal tab in the Diplomacy menu to see if you can get trade rights with any faraway powers. You'd be surprised by how much income this can bring in. But you should also be careful with who you trade with. Trading with other factions will cause other factions who don't like those factions to not like you. They will eventually declare war on you. So always check who is at war with a faction before trading with them, particularly in the early game. If they're a nearby threat, then maybe you might not want to trade with them. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, any Empire factions you reawaken, be sure to sell diplomatic treaties to them. They often sell these for a fortune because of the implications of refusing you. I suspect that maybe you might say no, and yet I also feel like maybe you wouldn't dare. Fine! So remember, diplomacy is a powerful tool for the Empire. Get paid to jump into wars and then sell territories back to your friends to boost relationships with them. You can acquire treaties and also get large sums of money from this. Check the Quick Deal tab to see if any factions wish to trade with you. The agreements are lucrative and can often be sold. Reason you suck with the Empire? Number 7. You forget your heroes. Now, you have multiple heroes to choose from as the Empire. First and foremost, you have your Wizards. The Empire has one of the most diverse cast of magic users in the game. You can get Wizards from a mind-blowing number of different schools of magic, and it's extremely important you exploit this resource. Every army should have a Wizard in there. Something that makes your magic even better is your Wizards can get access to the Imperial Pegasus mount making them extremely fast flying units, giving them fantastic protection from enemies that would otherwise do a lot of damage to them. My personal favourite is the Fire Wizard. It's no secret that the fire magic in this game is absurdly powerful. Rush to Firestorm and you'll have a great time watching the spells burn through the masses of enemies with cleansing flames. As I alluded to in my Ogre video, this is a fabulous tool in sieges. 
In my eyes, the Fire Wizard offers unparalleled offensive spells for dealing with large numbers of enemy troops. Perhaps you have certain single entities which you need to get rid of. Why not try out an Amethyst Wizard with their death magic and spam Spirit Leech on that unit until the problem goes away? Perhaps you have a lot of heroes and steam tanks in your army. Maybe you would benefit from a Jade Wizard and their life magic. Large number of gun lines, perhaps? Maybe a Light Wizard to cast the Net of Amintok to keep enemies in place. The Empire has magic to cover almost any situation. If you don't utilise this resource, then you're playing the Empire wrong. Ensure every army has a wizard in their ranks. Make sure to build the Alt Dwarf College of Mages to boost all Battle Wizard recruitment rank and hero capacity. Then you have your Captains and Warrior Priests, both highly armoured melee combatants, but they serve slightly different roles. The Captain is more offensive. He can be mounted on an Imperial Pegasus and can be sent after valuable units in the backline. The Warrior Priest is more of a frontline tank. As I said earlier, you want to send him to the front, just within range of your missile units, to tie up enemies charging your ranged contingents. For this reason, I actually prefer him on foot, and not mounted on his warhorse. The reason for this is he becomes a smaller target, and less likely to catch bullets from your gunnery line, and blades from your enemies. So keep him unmounted and at the front to tank the enemy in Sigmar's name. Finally, you have the Witch Hunters. These guys aren't particularly useful on the battlefield. Their ranged attack has a very short range and they don't have anywhere near the tanking ability that a captain or a warrior priest does. These guys are far better utilised on the overworld campaign map, getting rid of enemy agents. Permanently. If you do have them in your army, they have the scavenge ability, which increases your post-battle loot, and their ranged attack can do some reasonable damage against single entity enemies. If you do take them into battle, don't forget to use their Accusation ability, which reduces a whole host of defensive stats. Useful if you're fighting a certain unkillable vampire. So remember, every army should have a mage. Fire magic is good for killing and is my personal favourite. However, you have access to a staggering number of different laws, so you can pick the right magic for the job. Warrior Priests are amazing tanks. Keep them on foot and put them at maximum range of your missile units, they're great for tying up troops reaching your gun lines. Captains can also do this role, but they're not as tanky. They can, however, get an Imperial Pegasus mount and annoy the enemy's backline. Witch Hunters are good on the campaign map to assassinate enemy agents, scout ahead, and clear corruption. Reason you suck with the Empire? Number 8. You don't know what to build. Every settlement should have the Weaving House and its subsequent upgrades. It's a powerful and relatively straightforward income building. It doesn't matter which settlement it is, always get one of these to boost income. Secondly, if you want to grow a settlement, you need to stick down the farms. These will boost population growth. They're also very useful on frontier settlements as they boost casualty replenishment rate in the region, a nice little bonus. It's advisable to build multiple farms in provinces that you want to grow quickly, such as Altdorf, Nulm, and Marienburg. You can always demolish the farm once you've achieved the level of growth that you need. I'd recommend putting a farm in every city to boost growth in these key settlements as quickly as possible. If the territory is going to be a province you recruit military units from, always build the armory building in one of the minor settlements. Not just because it unlocks troops, including the dangerous Demigriff Knights and the far less dangerous Halberdiers, but also because it increases recruitment capacity in the region, as well as increasing your global recruitment capacity. This allows you to field armies faster and project your presence over a wider sphere of influence in the late game. Very useful when hiring armies in the far-flung corners of your empire. Don't skip them. Reason you suck with the empire? Number 9. You level your lords wrong. Lords are pretty straightforward as the Empire. You have generals, archlectors, and huntsmaster generals. Huntsmaster generals are okay in the early game, but they rapidly drop off in power in the middle and late game, so I advise against taking them. They don't do much damage, and they're not very tanky, and they don't get a mount, so I don't use them. I only use generals or archlectors. Archlectors are great tanks. Basically, very similar to your warrior priest heroes as I discussed earlier. 
I prefer to keep these guys on foot too, for precisely the same reason as I do with the warrior priests. I use them in battles the exact same way. Generals of the Empire are very similar to captains, apart from the fact that they can get access to a griffin mount, which is a reasonable flying single entity monster which can do a fair bit of damage. Now, your lords are not good fighters. Let me say that again, your lords are not good fighters. Don't go down the yellow line of skills to try and make them better, unless you're out of useful skill points in the other trees. Trust me, it's not worth it, they'll still likely get bodied by other lords. Your first priority should be the red line of skills to get your units their damage buffs. If you have any units in a certain category at rank 7, then pick up the later red line buffs. If you don't have rank 7 units, you want to start heading down the blue line of skills. The first red line skill you should get is Pistol Core, to increase the range damage of your missile infantry. I then like to pick up the Imperial Gunnery to get more ammunition for my Hellstorm rocket batteries when they start joining my armies. The first part of the blue line isn't very useful, I tend to go for the Safeguard skill to clear out Vampiric and Chaos Corruption, but really you can take anything you want. It's the middle and the end of the blue line tree where you get some really excellent buffs. Irrepressible gives you a massive 30% replenishment buff, do not miss this. Later on in the tree, you get the ever-popular Lightning Strike, Upkeep Reduction, more Replenishment Rate, and the Capstone Skill Headhunter, which gives yet more Upkeep Reduction and more Campaign Movement Range as well. These are fantastic buffs, which are all extremely useful to you. Your Lords aren't amazing fighters, but they're great leaders, and they're good at holding the line. Use the Red Line skills and the Blue Line skills to boost their leadership abilities, use the yellow line of skills as their dump stats. They're not going to be doing a lot of damage. Your ranged units, magic and artillery will. Have them as distractions. If you have skill points to burn, take melee defense and hit points. Don't bother with extra damage and melee attack. Your army will be doing all of the damage for you. The Empire is a complex faction with a lot of different ways to play but follow these steps and you'll be summoning the elect accounts in no time. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. And a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters, Dinkle250, Paugus, Joshua Krager, and D. I've been Blake, delivering my take. Thank you all so much for watching.